1990, seven black and one Filipino nurse filed complaints of systemic racism against Toronto's Northwestern General Hospital at the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Their case, which ended in victory four years later, shone a light on long-standing practices of racism in healthcare and targeting black workers. June Vicock, then the Director of Human Rights at the Ontario Federation of Labour, played a significant role in helping the nurses launch their case and win. In this interview, June speaks about how she came to be involved with the case and the support given by other black activists, including Akua Benjamin and Zanena Conde, as well as the Congress of Black Women. She also describes the heavy personal toll that the experience of racism in the hospital and in fighting the case took on the nurses themselves. But to start, June shares some of the other experiences that were part of her activist history within the labor movement itself. So, um, hello, I'm Margaret McPhail and I'm a member of the Rise Up uh, Feminist Archive and I'm very pleased today to be interviewing June Vicock. Thank you so much, June, for agreeing to be um, part of the Women Unite project. Um, the Women Unite interviews are uh, centered on uh, key moments in feminist history in Toronto uh, from the 1970s to the 1990s. And our primary focus today is going to be on the Human Rights Commission case against Northwestern General Hospital on behalf of a number of black nurses who charged the hospital with systemic racism. And June played a pivotal role in uh, championing this case. However, June, um, you have been a feminist, anti-racist and labor activist, trailblazer uh, uh, throughout your life. Uh, uh, for 19 of those years as the Director of Human Rights at the Ontario Federation of Labor, you've also been closely connected with a wide range of other groups and issues, including your involvement with the Congress of Black Women of Canada and the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. And uh, these contributions have been acknowledged by awards such as the YWCA Women of Distinction Award and the Bromley Armstrong Award for Equity and Human Rights, among others. And uh, that's just getting started. So I'd like to begin by asking you, June, to tell us a, a bit more about your background. So what do you think led to you becoming such an advocate and fighter for change? so early on in Guyana and uh, has kept you going in Canada? Well, a little bit about my background. I, uh, my first job was with the Ministry of, um, Ministry of Labor and Social Security in Guyana, where I worked as an inspector. I became involved with the union, which was a male dominated union at the time and was very active in many, um, many positions, executive positions and on committees. And I guess that more or less fueled my interest in, in the trade union movement generally. So when I came to Canada, I had one objective and that was to get a unionized job. That's all, that's, that's the goal I'd set for myself. I must find a unionized job. Because by then I had, uh, I, I could fully appreciate that workers represented by unions are in a much better position. In terms of advocacy, I didn't really set out to be an, uh, an advocate, so to speak, or an activist. Uh, but that just evolved over the years. Okay. And I think when you first came to Canada, you were a member of uh, QP 79? QP 79, yes. Right. And you threw yourself into uh, being involved with uh, that union as well, I think. You well, that was an interesting, how I got involved with QP was quite <laughs> interesting. Yes, it, uh, a, a unionized job. I worked in the business office of Riverdale Hospital. I was the patient's trust clerk. And I actually said to the local executive at, at the time that I was interested in participating. And um, they were kind of, well, you're new, so this could be complex. Let's handle it. 
And I thought, okay, and I backed away. And then we had this strike. I, I can't remember what year it was. It was um, municipal workers didn't have the right to strike then, but we mm -hmm. came out. And I remember the meeting where they were essentially suggesting that we had to return to work. Well, I couldn't understand why we had to return to work at that time when we hadn't accomplished what we set out to, to do. And uh, we knew it was an illegal strike going into it. So I got to the mic and I, I said just that. At the end of the meeting, um, it was Jeff Rose. He came up to me and he said, I'd like to encourage you to get involved with this local. And uh, he said, what can I, what I said, well, I tried at the local level, um, but people didn't um, take kindly to that. He said, well, what can I interest you in? And I said, either the women's committee or the health and safety committee. Well, about two or three years later, I received a call that there was a position on the women's committee, QP 79 women's committee and that um, asking if I was interested and I said yes. And that's where my involvement with the union movement in Canada started. And then at, at one point you were an advocate for the accrual of seniority on the part of women who are on maternity leave? Oh, well, that, that, <laughs> that was another defining moment, I guess. What had happened was the hospital was giving nurse pregnant nurses who were on maternity leave they were accruing seniority at the time it wasn't required it wasn't the law so when they realized what they were doing they not only stopped but they wanted to revert the women and i thought no you can't and uh it, that was quite a struggle and they said but we didn't have to, it's a mistake. And I said, well, it's a mistake you'll have to eat because you assigned vacations based on seniority. You promoted based on seniority. How are you going to go back and correct um, those? Um, what are you going to tell those nurses who were denied promotion because they didn't have the seniority? How are you going to remedy that? And um, it took a while, but eventually they realized that the union was right. We were right. That's great. That's great. And then, uh, you know, a big part, obviously, of your activism uh, with the labor movement uh, was uh, as the human rights director at the Ontario Federation of Labor, where you yes. were for 19 years, I think, starting in Yes, yes, yes. But you were the first a uh, woman from a racialized community to be in such a senior position with a central labor body. Tell me about that. Yeah. Well, I, I, from being active in QP79, I would attend conferences, OFL, women's conference and human rights conferences. And I came to know Janice Sarah, a woman I respect very much. Mm -hmm. And Janice called me one day to ask if I think I could, I would get a leave of absence. She wanted me to go to the Federation to organize the conference the Federation was having. That's the first conference on the issue of race. Building the participation of workers of color in their unions. And I told her I'd try. I said, but Janice, I... I don't know if I could do this. She said, yes, you can. I said, the only thing I've organized is a dinner party and sometimes they're not. They're, she said, no, June, you'll be fine. Let's see if we get you this um, secondment. And that's how I got to the Fed. I got to the Fed to organize the conference. It was a conference with close to 400 racialized trade. The Westbury Hotel. And strange enough, it was out of that conference that I got the idea for the Coalition of Black Trade Unions. 
one of the keynote speakers at the conference was Dr. Linda Murray, a very sharp woman, black woman out of, um, I think she, Detroit. Powerful speech and she was, and I remember clearly she said, look, I can't tell you guys how to organize in Canada, but this is what we did, the student doctors at, um, in, in um, Michigan. And she talked about establishing a chapter of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. Mm -hmm. So that's where the idea, of course, I have to say though, a number of racialized trade unionists were organizing before I got to the Fed. You know, you had, they weren't too many. You had Yvonne Bob, you had uh, Winnie Ng, you had Ann Newman who became president of her local, the telephonist at uh, Bell Canada. So you had people organizing before, I want to make that clear. Mm -hmm. But in terms of pulling it together, I recall we had 12 workshops at that conference. And I recall taking off 12 sheets of paper, giving it to the facilitators and asking them to see if they could influence people to join the coalition of black trade unions. Well, very few came back. And out of that, you know Madhu Das Gupta? Yes. Yeah, well, we give it to Madhu because now remember I'm on staff and I'm organizing to challenge the labor movement. So we give those um, sheets to Madhu that's looked on. Madhu held a, con uh, a caucus upstairs and that's how we got moving. So you you were involved with the um, the coalition of Black trade unionists for throughout your time at the oh yes oh yes right oh yes um, and so I mean over the years it must have expanded its role in terms of oh it did uh, in terms it of did. The federation and, and yeah. what about in the uh, member unions of the Ontario Federation of Labor the well some well. They would support in an interesting way. We had a, 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 a dinner every year, an anniversary dinner, and the affiliates were quite prepared to buy a table and send their members, but we couldn't get members to join the coalition per se, you know, because it was perceived. And yes, the function of the main goal of the coalition was to change the practices of unions, especially the hiring practices. So that was a very interesting time. So you uh, you played this role of being, um, uh, shall we say, on staff and a, an active supporter. A, a, uh, a double and agent. At the same time, a bit of a disturber on the uh, <laughs> sidelines. And uh, I understand that in 1990, you played that role at the Canadian Labour Congress Labor in Congress. holding an all yeah. white, uh, all white um, uh, candidate uh, slate. Yes. Can you tell me about that. All white executive. Yeah. Well, we had been advocating, writing Shirley Carr. We started organizing since Shirley Carr was the president. And we would write and bringing to their attention that the, the, the lack of inclusion on their, not only on the executive, but on boards, agencies, and commissions, which the labor movement recommended activists for. And so we got to that convention and uh, somebody said, let's run a candidate. Well, people talk, but in those days they were still, uh, what should I say? They, they were still afraid of the pushback from the union and the fellow white brothers and sisters. But at the end of the meeting that we had, Dory Smith, came up to me and asked June what about if I run and I said you don't have to ask me to run if you want to run run and so we got together but the interesting thing Dory Smith we just wanted to make a, a point send a message 
but he started behaving like a candidate <laughs> and knocking on doors and <laughs> and really campaigning. Well, at the end of it, I remember Jean Jean Claude. He was from Cup W, I think. And when he announced the vote, Dory had over 1,200 votes. And Jean-Claude said, well, the message has been sent. So out of that convention and that, um, and, and, and that effort, the, the CLC established a task force to look at just that inclusion, representation of racialized groups on the board. And it, as it came out of the task force, they were giving us one seat. Well, I felt, and others, that that was a little too late, <laughs> that we, um, we should at least have two seats. And that's where we made the, the, the button to demonstrate one plus one equals two. And I'm happy to report that in the end, we did have two seats. That's great. That's a, a lot of a lot of work. And so over that time, did you notice um, uh, much change in both the unions and the central labor bodies, both yeah. on the part of, both for women's equality and and for uh, racialized? Well, what I find, I think the Federation was a little ahead of the affiliates. And the, the uh, Federation sets the policy overall mm -hmm. but the, they have there's no capacity for them to implement the policies that they establish the implementation comes from the affiliates so we had these very um powerful papers women did a lot of work you had a powerful women's committee you women like judy darcy judy rebeck judy rebeck was like a dog with a bone at convention about reproductive rights. You had Jamie Cash with child care. You had um, the, the OFL Women's Committee, I would say was a did groundbreaking work because of their efforts. A lot of affiliates more or less followed the Federation. But as I said, the Federation had no mandate. So you had these lofty policy papers seeking change, but there was no change because you can't force the affiliates to make the change. One of the things that the Federation, that they, um, I'm proud of the Coalition of Black Trade Unions, one we did, we developed a report card on the hiring practices of unions. And no big research, you could look around and you could, the activists, we ask the activists in the union, how many racialized group you have, or how many, how many um, Aboriginal people, the, the target groups. And we made a report card and I tell you, I guess that embarrassed a few of them. There was a flurry of activity with respect to hiring. Uh, QP, my own union hired a few. Opsu had had a few and they, increase the number and so <laughs> Carol Wall, that's how Carol Wall got hired. I remember it was, it was coming close to convention and um, I'm going in the elevator and um, oh, now I've forgotten his name, but one of the executive said, June, are you doing a report card this year? And I said, yes, and he said, can you wait? I said, what? He said, I'm trying to get one. <laughs> and the one he was trying to get was Carol Wall. <laughs> Good decision. Oh, what's his name? What's his name? I forgot his name. Uh, yes, I do that. <laughs> <laughs> Can you wait? Why? <laughs> Is it ready? Is it about ready? Can you wait? I'm trying to get one. Wanted a better mark on the report card, obviously. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So um, I just wanted to turn to the involvement with the human, Ontario Human Rights case um, against Northwestern General Hospital. 
on behalf of the nurses who charge the hospital with systemic racism. Can you tell me about that, what the case was about, and, and particularly how you got involved? Well, I was at work one day and um, I got a call and this woman was very, very upset. She said her name was Sharon. She worked at Northwestern. And she began to tell me all that was happening. Very upset. I could hardly hear her. I had to hold the phone away from my ear. And she said, I've tried here. I've tried there. I've tried everywhere. Nobody would help me. And I said, well, I'll help you. But, Sharon. If things are as bad as you are saying they are at Northwestern, then it can't be you alone. They've got to be other nurses. So you see if you could find other nurses experience, have, with similar experiences and then call me and we we'll take it from there. Well, about two to three weeks later, she called me. She said, June, I'm as high as a kite. And I said, what are you on? She said, nothing, nothing. I'm, I, I found a nurse with similar experiences. And she says that she knew of others. Would you see us? I said, yes, I will. Well, Sharon came in <laughs> and I remember having to find an office with, with 12 women. 11 black nurses and one Filipino nurse. And that's how I got involved. So were these, these nurses at the time were not part of the union that was part of the federal? No, agency? they were, that's the interesting part. They were members of ONA. Mm -hmm. These are registered nurses, members of ONA. And you know, ONA at the time was not affiliated to the OFL that came after out of that struggle i would say and i remember asking julie davis i said julie these women are here well everybody in the ofl wanted to know what was going on what's june doing now all these people in the office what's happening so when i explained to julie davis julie said um she said you know they're an owner they have a union i said yes and this is what they said i advise them to go to the union and this is what they are alleging. And, um, and you know that owner is not affiliated to the Fed. And I said, yes, but I feel like we should be helping these women. And she said, go on, do what you have to do. And um, she was very supportive. I spent a lot of time <laughs> on, on those cases. So Tell me a little bit about um, what, what started to be uncovered as the case moved forward. Okay. I mean, if they were that upset, obviously there were some pretty- Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Sharon was a legend. Sh Sharon was born in Nova Scotia. She said she had a very poor background, always wanted to be a nurse, worked saved their money till she could go to school, became a nurse. And she was interested in being a Canadian, being a Canadian born nurse. She felt that she ought to have more rights than these West Indian born nurses. It took a little while to say, Sharon, listen, what is happening to you is happening to them also. So you need to understand that you should be supportive of them and they supported of you. And as a group, we may be able to make, to break through. What others were alleging was differential treatment in terms of where they work, hours of work, in terms of discipline. And eventually they, the um, investigator from the Human Rights Commission said, June, within a couple of days, I could tell a black nurse because the, I would say, pull that file, that's a black nurse. Why? Because it was so, they were being over 
police, so to say. They, they, were, they were being watched, they were being documented, uh, and starting from the inception of work, because I heard a black nurse would have three, maybe four um, references, while a white nurse, one, maybe two. So there was a pattern. They got they they were generally on the on the heavy lifting floors, chronic floors. They complained of not being able to work, work in departments like emerge. And and generally doing sh the kinds of shifts which didn't lend itself to them uh, taking classes that would upgrade the skills. So, um, so you're saying that their professionalism was not being acknowledged in the same way and they're just not being given opportunities to... Ex exactly, right. exactly. And I would imagine if they were involved in the, you know, primarily in the chronic care and the, you know, uh, that kind of uh, wards, that there would be a lot of heavy lifting, like it would be that's hard right. work. So there would be more injuries that's and right. those kinds of that's things. That's right, that's right. It's laborious work. Right. I mean, the nurse, the, 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 the work of uh, nursing is not an easy job by any means, but they were concentrated in the heavy lifting areas. Discipline, how discipline was meted out. And can you tell me, you know, what impact this had on, in terms of maybe promotions or was, was that reflected in, in who got to, I mean, I'm imagining that if they weren't able to get, let's say additional training or take part in, um, you know, workshops or in-house um, uh, courses that, uh, that that would have affected their opportunities as well. That's right. That's right. And move up. That's right. That's right. Yes. Yes. Those opportunities were denied them because now, of the way they work. <laughs> so I, I, well, I'm imagining, you know, it's interesting you say that, uh, um, that Sharon, the first nurse, um, yeah. was a uh, Canadian born from, from Nova Scotia, because my understanding is that one of the, um, uh, ways in which uh, this, uh, these attitudes were, uh, the racist attitudes were perpetuated were by referring to people as foreign trained nurses right. rather than uh, professional nurses or whatever. That's Is right. that, That's right. That's right. that was sort of code? Yes, yes. But I, I, Sharon wanted to be a team leader. That was her ambition and she was never allowed to team lead. And uh, while some West Indian nurses were leading teams, so that she was really offended by that. Do you think that um, that because she was um, a disturber, uh, yes. from this into question, that that played a role in what she was able to do? Yes, yeah, she was. A, she was a disturber and she was a fighter she had had a one of the reasons why we got the cases to be uh investigated as early as they did back then it used to take wasn't unusual to take three four years because she had had a a, a claim at a human rights commission on the grounds of disability but she was seeking accommodation Mm -hmm. So when we were able to wrestle with the commission, God, they too was a problem in terms of getting the cases heard as a systemic matter. They were able to tag these other cases on to Sharon's case that claiming disability. That is why we were able to get um, to get it moving so quickly. I'm interested in what you were saying about the investigators moving forward on this case and after a few days able to say by the size of the file that right. they knew, um, you know, yeah, that it was a black nurse. nurse. Uh, 
Uh -huh. um, did you see this case as having, affecting how the investigators themselves started to understand these cases? Oh, for have... sure, mm -hmm. for sure. Because we didn't have an easy time at the Human Rights Commission. Mm -hmm. It's like we had to convince the commission. The first struggle was convince, convincing the Federation, although they had established a, a systemic unit, it was, a, it, it was quite a, a challenge and a struggle to get them to accept. And to this day, I don't know why they couldn't see that it was a systemic. If you got 11 black women claiming almost the same thing, same employer during the same period. How could it not be systemic? So what, what, what was the outcome of this case? Well, we had a very good, they settled eventually and they said that they, have a, they had, I would say, a, a decent settlement. I, you know, no amount of money could compensate those women for what they went through. As a matter of fact, several of them never worked again as a nurse, De totally destroyed. One had a, and the youngest one, Lana Henry, a complete nervous breakdown. Sharon herself went down. It was quite a struggle. And they, um, uh, we had a mediator, um, Mr. Lewis, Stephen Lewis. Stephen Lewis became the mediator, very good mediator, and was able to convince the hospital, look, you know, this may be in your interest to settle. Mm -hmm. So, and then the same Human Rights Commission came out and hailed it as such a victory and it's the first successful case of systemic human rights settled in Canada. Meanwhile, we had such a hard time with them. So do you, this case then would have acted as a foundation then for other cases going forward after it? Yes, after then about a year or two later, not a group of nurses came and um, they were from Branson Hospital. These were older women, very dignified and uh, they were all in managerial positions and realized at some point that the hospital was reorganizing and they were reorganizing all the black managers out. All the black managers out. But going back to North, Northwestern, I want to say, uh, I get a lot of credit for the work at Northwestern, but Dr. Benjamin was also involved. Akua Benjamin played a significant role she was involved with the Congress of the Black Women of Canada? Yes, yes, yeah, she's, yeah, she and I were co the Congress at the same time. So the Congress played a supporting uh, role? Oh, role. yes, mm -hmm. for sure, yes. Can you tell me about that a bit? What? Pardon? In terms of uh, submissions or um, uh, encouraging people, what, what, what kind of role did they play? They were very encouraging, they were behind the scenes talking to people, it took a lot. <laughs> Zanena Kande, she worked, you know, behind the scenes, helping open doors. Mm -hmm. It was a community struggle. So that period of time through, uh, and I, that period of time from the late 1980s, I would say to the mid 1990s, you referred to Stephen Lewis and he, um, uh, had a, authored a report at that time. There were, was a quite a lot of um, anti-black racism. Anti-black racism and, and a lot of outrage um, at it. Um, and I, um, the Congress, uh, I believe, played a role in that as well. Oh yes, oh yes. S made submissions, and the Congress played a role in policing in raising issues around carding. Mm -hmm. uh, they were um, Albert Johnson, the police killing of Albert Johnson in his home. The Congress was very, very active around those issues. And of course, in women's issues generally. 
So you play, you were active with the with the Congress during those years as well as on yes. the work of the OFL? Yes, I was active with the Congress. I was active with the Coalition of Visible Minority Women. Okay. Can you tell me about both of those organizations a bit? What kinds of work they were involved in? Well, we, the, the Coalition of Visible Minority Women were really organizing women and raising challenging, I should say, main street feminist movements about the lack of uh, participation of women of color. So that was the work, um, both the Congress and in particular, the Coalition of Visible Minority Women, with being very, very active in, in that struggle, raising issues around uh, inclusion. So one of those organizations would have been the National Action um, NAC, the Status yeah. of Women, the Coalition and the Congress were both member organizations of that. That's right. And I'm assuming they played a role in, in um, pressing the National Action Committee to become more um, outspoken. Um, yes, yes. And that was long before we got Sunira. Right, right. That, that was in the early 90s, I think, 1992, yes. thereabouts. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what other uh, kinds of issues would you say that the Congress took up during this, this time? Well, I, I think those were the main issues. Mm -hmm. um, I know we were very active in terms of um, uh, policing issues, very active in education issues, uh, very active around uh, women's issues generally. At one point, we did a lot of work around uh, child care or, 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 or um, not so much child care, but um, it's gone. Well, I think there was a film that the Congress, the Toronto chapter of the Congress of Black Women produced uh, about racism in child care as, as a yes, teaching tool. Yes, film. yes. No, um, it's a ministry and I can't recall. Yes, I have those moments, <laughs> <laughs> moments too. If I can go back to the uh, public health uh, nurses, uh, or not, sorry, the, not the public health nurses, the, the nurses um, and um, the case at the Human Rights Commission, how important um, do you think it was that the bodies like the Ontario Federation of Labour uh, played um, a role in supporting that? And, and I think it would be very hard for uh, individuals themselves to sustain yes. a case over that length of time. Yes. So I'm wondering what you yeah. think about the labor movement and particularly in this case, the Ontario Federation of Labor. Well, I think they played a very important role. Um, like I said, the time spent, even my time, mm -hmm. there are many, many days and nights, the hours spent was very significant. And um, the women's committee supported the effort. Affiliates supported the effort. So the input was quite valuable. It, it has often seemed to me that through that time, the 80s and, and the 90s, that many uh, labor organizations were, and I think you alluded to this earlier with the Women's Committee and the uh, you know, human rights groups um, in, the, in labor and the coalition of Black trade unionists, that they were taking up uh, issues and of, of hiring, of practices within the unions, of uh, bargaining issues that then became um, bigger social movements and, and moved into legislation and the fact that they were an organized body helped move those issues along. Oh, um, for sure. Yeah. For sure. So, but it came, but they, but they, but they, they 
organizing came from the workers. It was out of the workers going to the mics of conventions and really embarrassing unions. You know, well, look at your staff. <laughs> you know, you can't go telling employers, you can't make a credible case for employment equity when you as an employer doing the same things. So it was the work of the activists in the unions that really pushed the Fed and eventually got to some of the uh, affiliates. We, some people would say they came to the table kicking and screaming. So I wanna ask you, um, you've had a very um, active and influential career. Um, both through your role through the Ontario Federation of Labour, but also through your um, engagement with community-based groups and, and uh, activist groups in a whole bunch of you know, different issues and, and areas. And today I think we see um, uh, young activists again, stepping up to pick up the mantle around feminist issues, anti-racist, activism and and in the and in the labor movement um, which is to me at least quite exciting um, and I'm wondering what advice you might give these young activists who are taking up this uh, this these leadership roles for change today yeah, well they make me very proud proud as an old timer <laughs> and uh, they have to keep going but they also have to take care of themselves. You build support for your struggle and you keep moving, but they gotta, this struggle against, and I'm speaking here of race, it's like a marathon. You run your race, don't drop the baton, make sure you pass it on. And it's, it has to keep going. When you won't solve all the problems, you, maybe you may not see the benefits of your efforts, but the next leg hopefully will. It's a marathon, I'm telling you. You must look back on uh, your own um, career in this and uh, uh, understand very much how it is a marathon. And yet you must also see, see such change since you began as well. It's kind of that balancing act yeah. of seeing so much more to do, yeah. but all, also recognizing what changes have taken place. Oh yeah. So yeah. if I were to ask you what you would see as I guess defining changes, can you point to anything you think is well the discussions around race because when I joined the Fed, I mean, they got so many complaints when I would go out and speak to affiliates. And uh, it is more acceptable now. At least people listen politely if they don't, if some don't take action, at least they listen politely. That's a change. At one time, the labor movement seemed to be uh, doing okay in terms of hiring minorities, but now we seem to have peaks and valleys. I think they have to take a, a good look at their hiring practices again, but then of course they're not hiring, so you can't see change if they don't have opportunities to make the, 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 the changes that are necessary. Um, but there seems to be a more, uh, they're more receptive. They're more re receptive to the issues that um, people of color raise in their unions. And they seem to be a little more cohesion. I don't know, this is from the outside looking in. With the benefit of experience. Yeah. It's but if I could go back and talk a little bit about the impact of the, uh, those complaints on the nurses, although it was perceived as, um, as, as um, 
a good thing. And it was a good thing that they were able to be compensated somewhat. I want to stress that those nurses are destroyed. Destroyed. Sharon, one Saturday morning, I, I live in Markham, not far from Markham, Stouville Hospital. And she called and she said, June, what are you doing? I said, you know, nothing much. She said, can you come? I'm in the hospital. I'm at Markham. And when I went, Sharon handed me this form. This was a form that committed her to the psychiatric ward. And she said, you keep this and do what you want with it. You know my story. So I keep telling people, this seems to be my claim to fame, but in reality, many of those not nurses, uh, family breakup. One nurse, her husband was very, very upset that she would settle. He didn't think that she got enough because they had lost so much. But the Human Rights Commission don't, uh, they have this notion that they're an organization that don't penalize. They want to change behavior, not penalize you for that behavior. So those nurses, I'm still in touch with quite a few of them. And uh, it's really sad, really sad. One mother told me my daughter wanted to be a nurse from the time she was a little child in Jamaica. And that she was so proud of her daughter, came up here, finished high school, went to nursing school, Lana Henry. And that is Lana, and Lana never worked again. She tried. She would go to the, the hospital, she would go to work, and she said, June, if I last an hour, I could feel myself breaking down. Several of them, really sad, very sad. That's a very powerful um, I don't want to say story, that's not what I want to say. It, it's a very powerful tribute to the painful but work that uh, people do to create change and the personal price that they often pay to do that. Um, so thank you for sharing that. I, I think it is important that people understand how um, personally traumatic this work can be for people and just how courageous they are to stand up and continue doing it um, because of the price that they often, often pay. Thank you for sharing that. And it ties in, I think, with your advice to young activists today to um, take care of themselves along the way, um, because it is, uh, it can be such a, it could take such a toll on you yes, um, it can. personally. So thank you. Thank you very much, June, for this interview. I don't know if there's anything else you want to say or add at this point, but I really do appreciate you speaking with us about this. Awesome. I'm happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you.